I'm Duke McDowell. I'm president of Sterling Custom Homes. I want to welcome you here to be a part of the Sterling Custom Homes Custom Home Building Seminar. Let's talk about the, the stages of construction. We've got pre-construction and a lot of things in the pre-construction are your plans and your HOA um, parts of it, your foundation and uh, how the foundation is uh, made and also put in place. Uh, the framing side of it is another stage where we actually go through and, and uh, uh, the process of framing your house. Uh, your mechanicals, which are your electrical and your plumbing uh, that go in the house, your wall finishes, your interior finishes, which are a lot of your uh, doors, windows, trim, uh, those type of uh, uh, finishes. Your fixture installation is your plumbing, your uh, electrical fixtures, uh, and then we finally get to your completion. So this is kind of the overview of what a builder is going to be going through during the stage of construction of the home building process. So let's kind of go into the pre-construction stage as we talked about at the very beginning and kind of go in a little bit more detail of what that is. We, uh, in the pre-construction stage, we start out in the permitting process. That permitting process, we're going to go to the ACB, which is the Architectural Control Boards, your HOA or homeowners associations, and we're going to submit our plans to them and we're going to uh, go through their permitting process. We're also at this time going through the city and the county uh, permitting process. And in, as we know in the city of, of uh, Austin, that sometimes could be a little bit longer than, than what we would hope for. But uh, as we go through these processes, we're also going and, and uh, sitting down to our water, wastewater companies. This is where we'd be submitting our septic uh, design to the engineer and to the county as well. Uh, environmental, we're going to go in and do the environmental uh, parts to the lot. Uh, we'll put up our erosion control. There are companies out there that actually come in and inspect that uh, erosion control. Uh, so that's our environmental. And then also the builder is, is sitting down and, and working on the estimate, uh, the estimating their plans internally. They should begin to do, start doing their takeoffs. Uh, these quantity takeoffs are real important. Uh, again, the difference here it, between a, a cost plus builder and a fixed price builder is, you know, the builder that's a fixed price builder is more concerned about his estimate takeoffs. He doesn't want to go out there and send uh, 200 studs out there when it only takes 165 to do the job. Well, in a cost plus scenario, he doesn't really care. What he does is he sends out the 200 studs because he's not going to expense that estimator because he sees no value for that estimator to be out there to get the right stud count out there. Why? He's getting paid on the 200 or the 165. Which one do you think he wants to get paid on? Uh, and I know as you go through this from a builder's perspective, the quantity takeoffs are anywhere from your tile to your lumber to, to everything. And so ask one of your questions which should be, does you know, that builder have an uh, estimator on staff that they can go through uh, these takeoffs? Uh, plan distribution. The builder at this stage is, is going through a, a, some sort of plan distribution process. Uh, what that is, is uh, we call them at, uh, at our company and stuff, we call them trade partners. And we kind of talked about that a little bit. That's your subcontractors, suppliers, and your vendors. Uh, those people are important to us. They're, they're our partners in this deal. So we begin to, to, to hand out these plan distributions to them. Most of these guys have CADs. So we actually send the CAD files over to them electronically. They're able to go in and, and cut out the section that they're just interested in on those set of plans. Then they print it out, hand it to the guy that's actually going out into the field, and then he can uh, he knows the areas and everything else where he should be working and what he should be doing. So let's kind of dive into the foundation stage. This is uh, one that I have a lot of passion with. Uh, it's usually the slab is designed by a structural engineer. As you can tell by the uh, the picture that's up there now, the green is uh, outlines the uh, actual beams. Those beams are uh, put there in certain distances. Uh, on purpose for the calculating the loads that will be out onto the slab through walls or, or uh, uh, fireplaces or whatever. And then those are interior beams as we call them. The purple uh, side of it are your exterior beams. Those exterior beams are due to really kind of hold up the slab um, from the outside and it keeps it from moving from one way or the other. Uh, the other thing that the, uh, the engineer should know is your PI value. Your PI value is called plasticity index, and that uh, value is your elasticity of soils. And what it does, uh, it actually tells you how much the ground is going to heave when it gets wet. Now your PI value is what you want to be looking for, is something that's between 30 or below. If you use a, a 30 or below PI value, you won't have the, the problems uh, with the slabs potentially later in life because of the values as they get the expanded contracts of the soil and moving your slab around over time. 
So where do you get this PI value? A lot of times, it, you know, the best thing to do is to go to the original developer of that property. This also, at this stage, you're determining whether or not you're putting piers or pilings into the slab. If you have a real deep slab that's going to be 13, 14 feet out, your uh, engineer is going to come in here and he's going to design in some piers that basically work like stilts. And they're, uh, they're designed to hold the slab up and keep it from moving. Now let's kind of move over into uh, different types of slabs. Okay, there, there are two different types of uh, slabs in a foundation uh, stage. You've got the hand-tied steel, which that's what this picture is here, is uh, uh, a slab that's been tied with steel. You can see the rebar that's in it. It's on a certain number of square inches. Uh, you go into your slab heights uh, uh, relative to the streets and other properties that are around it. It's really important because of your drainage. Again, we just kind of talked about the PI value. What creates the problem with slabs? Eight out of ten times is the fact that they're not draining properly, that the water is actually draining into the slab instead of away from the slab. You also start establishing your slab drops here, and that goes into uh, multiple different things, your floorings, your different tiles, uh, you, whether you're doing stone out there on the outside of the patio. Uh, these are your slab drops that you establish and put in there. So knowing what the floorings are on the house as you go through are real critical to make sure that you don't have any transition strips as you go through uh, a house later, and we'll talk about that a little bit later in the process. Uh, talk to your builder and see if, uh, if he has some sort of quality, internal quality inspections. Not city inspections, but internal quality inspections. We're talking about does he have something set up internally where he goes through at different stages and actually logs in and says, you know, we're, we're, we're checking for this. We're checking for the plastic. We're making sure the plastic is cut down through the center so that the concrete can get down into the beam. We're going over and making sure that steel is tied properly you know, some sort of checklist that he has. Uh, internally, we have six of them that go between now and the, at the very beginning of the foundation and the time that we actually pour of them. So we, we obviously think of that slab as a very critical item. Uh, this here is a picture of a uh, post-tension slab. Those uh, red uh, lines that are going through there are actually the post-tension cables. Those are, a post-tension slab is designed to be a, a homogeneous slab. What that means is you're basically going in there and it's gonna float and then as the left side rises, the right side lowers. And that's how a post-tension slab is designed to work. It works off compression and tension. It actually takes and it, and it pulls a slab together with those uh, cables. It, it's a re, it reinforces the foundations, the, those cables. Now, a cable slab is a reduced price. It, it costs less to do a cable slab than it does a steel slab. Uh, so there's less labor involved. There's actually less materials involved in it. So it's going to cost less. A lot of builders go to this because of that, strictly because it's a cost item. Okay, And so it's a way for them to come in and actually cut the cost. But you also have a, a problem in uh, the cables is that, as you can see, it's a non-forgiving slab. It's got to be poured correctly. If it's not, you're going to have all kinds of problems. You can't allow that cable to bow. You can't allow it to rise. If you do any of those, then it creates, as you pull tension on it, it creates uh, uh, voids and stuff that push either the concrete down or push the concrete to the side. So uh, the room for error in a cable slab is very minimal. I've shown you a little picture here too of what we call the dead end of that cable. That dead end of the cable is actually nailed up onto the form and it's at the very, uh, it, it goes from one end of the form all the way down that cable to the live end, which is the end that they drill a hole through the actual form and pull that cable through. Okay, and so that cable now is sticking out on the outside of the form. After you pour the slab, then you come in and you strip the forms off of the slab, which are the wood pieces and stuff around the outside edge. And seven to 10 days later, then a professional engineering company comes out and stresses that cable. They actually hook a machine onto what we call the live end, which is the end that was sticking through the form. They, they hook a machine onto it and actually pull tension on that cable up to a certain amount of pounds. And then they cut that cable off. Another one of the things that you want to look at in the foundation stage is make sure it's being, uh, it's being poured with uh, concrete pumping. There's several reasons for this. The concrete pump delivers the concrete in place. It actually puts it right there where that, that uh, subcontractor, supplier, or trade partner put, wants to put that concrete. It's not a big old truck and where you back the truck up and you, you, you throw in six different uh, uh, chutes and then you speed that truck up with a big old drum and, and run it as fast as you can and throw that concrete out there on that slab as fast as you can. That's actually detrimental to the actual concrete. 
Uh, the concrete pumping, the advantage of it, it actually stops that separation is what, what I just said. And when you roll that concrete out there and try to throw it 10, 15 feet, you separate the sand, the rock, and the cement. And those are the basic points okay, of what makes up concrete. Well, when you separate that, what do you think the strength of that concrete is? It goes down. Okay? And so when you separate that concrete and you separate that strength, what do you think may happen to the slab? So, so putting it in, in uh, concrete, uh, pouring it in place with a concrete pump, that's a big advantage. Uh, it also helps us control the water. Pouring it in place with a concrete pump helps us control that water. So there we get a, more of a consistency of the concrete throughout. Uh, it enables us to access the job quicker and easier. Uh, you can imagine if we have some of these slabs that are 10 or 12 feet up in the air and we're trying to back a truck up there and, and get the chute all lined up and, and as far as I know physics so far we can't get that concrete to go uphill and it's just a, it's a big old mess. So what we would do with these pumps it gives us that opportunity to uh, pour the concrete in place no matter what the height uh, is on the slab. It also reduces the time of pour. Okay, So it takes back and and comes in and, and we're able to reduce the pour instead of backing a truck back up there, zooming that truck out, then pull that truck up, do another one of it, zoom it out and go back. We're able to go to one spot and you usually will line up two trucks to the back of a concrete pump. You'll pour out one, then another guy continues to pour, he pulls out, you back another truck back up in there, he begins to pour, this guy's out and, he, and we do that back and forth. And that keeps us pouring constantly which is important. What we don't want to do is we don't want to stop the pour. If you stop the pour, you have a tendency for that concrete to dry out. And if it dries out, it creates what we call a cold joint. And that's where you'll see a lot of your cracking in slabs are at cold joints. It's where the, the concrete doesn't actually bond together uh, because there's two different temperatures, there's two different moisture contents in the, in the concrete. Uh, the slab, as you go through it, establishes quality of a home. I mean, I don't know how much more to stress it than that. You know, if you get a good bottom and that's your slab, the rest of your life is, is simple. Uh, it goes through and it makes your whole process through the building uh, a lot easier. Let's kind of go through a, a little bit of the step into the foundation, I'm sorry, into the framing section of, of this part. This is a lumber chart and it, it starts from January and goes through April. You can kind of see the fluctuating side of this. And what we want to do and, and kind of show you through this is how that lumber actually fluctuates through the whole process of uh, when a builder is actually framing this. Typically the way you price a cost plus item, the builder goes out and he'll uh, price out his lumber. He'll get it back to the customer and he'll say, all right, your lumber is going to cost X. Well, if he goes through, he's got no way of actually locking that price in for a long period of time. So the cost plus guy does what? He goes in there and he puts the price in it and he says, all right, this is what it's going to cost on this day. As you can tell from this chart, it begins to rise on him. The next thing he does, he goes, he sends it out there and drops it off. The customer's paying for it. So he's betting on the fact that if it goes up, he makes more money. If it goes down, the customer's happy. The odds are it goes up. And so if you go into and you look at it from a fixed price standpoint, look at the builder and see if he goes and, and actually um, uh, puts uh, with the, or works out a deal with the lumber company, does specific takeoffs, all the two befores, all the two by sixes. He estimates all those and then he goes and he, he locks his lumber in for a quarterly basis. Uh, you usually get better price that way. Also too, if you think about from a cost plus standpoint, what's the builder's incentive to go in there and get the best price on that lumber? There really is none. I mean, uh, the more you spend, the more I make. You know, so it, that's kind of a good deal uh, from that, that side of it. So let's kind of dive into some terminology for you guys. Uh, let's talk a little bit about a header. A header goes over the doorway typically and over a window. Uh, that's where you see a lot of your headers. Now, a good way to go and look at a, a custom builder, look at his frame job. Uh, go through and walk through that house and, and look at it. Look and see how he frames this house. See if he's putting two by 12 headers over his doors and his windows. It's not, it's not required by code. You can use a 2x6, you can use a 2x8, you can use less sized material, but you get, again, you begin to establish the quality right here of where you're going to go with that window. Is that window going to sag a little bit? Can I get a 2x8, stretch that 2x8 out of it? Or should I just go and put a 2x12 up there and never have to worry about it again? Uh, you know, it also comes into, if I put a 2x12 on your header, Guess, uh, guess what happens when we put our rods or our curtains up? You actually hit something that's solid. I mean, you guys ever hang any rods and, and stuff on curtains and, and then you go through it and the sheetrock just keeps going and, and everything else, you can't figure out why is that void there? 
Well, if you had a 2x12 there, you could actually hang your, your uh, uh, curtain rod very easily because you hit something that's solid. Uh, going down into your studs, uh, those are your uh, vertical items there. Again, on that picture for you, kind of depict what a stud is and where they actually go. Your subflooring, it's in that doorway. It's a little bit harder to see, but that uh, your subfloor is actually your, your second floor. Again, another way there to kind of test your builder is uh, you can look and see uh, whether or not it's three-quarter inch on the subflooring. Is it an inch and an eighth? Is he coming in there and putting two three-quarter inches pieces to end up an inch and a half? Uh, all of those things are critical because sound. I mean, think about it. If I'm up there on three-quarters of an inch and I've got kids running up and down the hallway, what's that sound going to happen? It's going to go right down through that house, okay, and right down into where I'm sitting there trying to watch uh, my sports, you know, on Sunday afternoon. So I'm a little upset if the kids are going through that. Now, if i got an inch and an eighth piece of plywood up there, I'm not going to hear it as much, okay? So it's a little bit thicker. Uh, it deadens the sound a little bit more for you, and it's also a better product and, and uh, you know, for sagging purposes. Uh, plates. You have your plate, your bottom plate, and your top plate. Typically, they're called, your bottom plate is called the sole plate. It's usually one piece of two before that's laid down flat. That uh, sole plate, sometimes you'll see us do two plates there. And one of the reasons why we put two down at the bottom is so that when we go and we, we put tile in, we actually put the base on top of the tile, and when you put the base on top of the tile, then you can actually shoot a nail into something that's solid, okay? And it does make a difference. Uh, and that way, when you double up that uh, stud, then you're shooting uh, your nail gun and stuff into something that's solid anywhere that you go, and that's critical. Uh, let's kind of dive in a little bit a little bit more on, on some of the framing, the builders uh, from our builder perspective side. These are, this picture is of some steel beams. Uh, these are steel beams that are out there. This is what we kind of call an upside down house. Uh, that the main portion of the house, the first floor is up on top of the steel. The bottom section of this is actually an airplane hanger. Uh, this is uh, this guy that came to us. He wanted us to set this up to where he could fit a king air in there with the 40 foot, uh, 44 foot uh, wingspan. Uh, when you put an airplane back in there, guess what, guys? We can't have any type of post. We can't have anything else that you can push that airplane back. So we basically are clear spanning, you know, 44 feet to push that airplane back in the front all the way through that whole house. So the steel beams used to help eliminate the deflection that's carried by those loads directly above because we have this, basically the first portion of the house is directly on top. The framing stage, as we go through, we start talking about uh, some trusses. The trusses are actually the, the webbed looking pieces in this shot. Uh, those ha help support the second floor. Uh, they're a, a support piece. Uh, they're rigid a lot of times. We have some interior beams there that actually die into those trusses. And you see the, the joist hangers on those. Those beams are to carry the loads as well from those trusses. Uh, so that it helps us uh, depict there's probably in this beam shot, there's probably a wall directly above that beam. We get no sagging that way if we can line up the beam over uh, the walls. Uh, so it, it comes into the engineering that we talked about before, uh, the structural engineering and that engineer that will actually set that up. We begin at this stage too, uh, creating all the ceiling treatments. That's what the vertical two befores that are up there and that little curved line that's there. You can see that as we begin to create that ceiling treatment uh, that was going in that dining room as we begin to frame that at this stage. The frame carpenter, uh, he's the guy actually putting all the lumber and stuff up in, in the house. The frame carpenter is real important. I mean, he's going to go in, he's going to begin to frame the walls, the joists, and the rafters, and that's what you're seeing in this picture is basically a house skeleton that's uh, with the walls, ceiling joists, and rafters up. Uh, he also puts in your arches and creates all those arches that you see. He builds all the ceiling uh, treatments that are in there uh, through lumber. He goes in and he, he uh, puts your cornice and uh, deck and your fascia boards on in your house. He'll install the windows on the outside. He'll also go in and install your exterior doors on your house. Uh, and he comes in, and, and, and honestly, we talked about it in the, the foundation, but the framer actually sustains the, the, the framing of the house, sustains the quality of that house. So what you basically have done now is you've created a home from the good foundation of the quality, and you've sustained it all the way through 
uh, the framing side of it. So let's kind of go through the uh, mechanical side uh, of this as well. We begin after the framing stage. We start doing what we call the rough end stage. We start installing the plumbing. That's your PVC and your copper a lot of times go up through the roof and, and out. Uh, we install the HVAC ducting and HVAC is your heating, venting, and AC, uh, air conditioning. Uh, we install the electrical wiring at this stage. Uh, let's kind of dive in a little bit into the uh, HVAC stage. Uh, that's always a, you know, one that, that, that we get a lot of questions on from a lot of the customers. Uh, let, what we do in the HVAC stage, we calculate the AC uh, loads, which is our manual J, what we call a manual J for our energy efficiency. Now, in each one of the energy efficiency area, each geographic region is, is different. Uh, if you look at the map up there, the color map, you can see there's one through five geographic regions throughout this country. So depending on where you fall within that region, it's kind of depending on how we actually run the energy efficiency and design that according to your air conditioning in your house. So these are a critical part of as you go through that whole process because what falls in there is your actual room area. How big is your room? How much air am I going to have to flow into there? That's all part of your uh, manual J form. What's my sun orientation? How much glass do I have out there? What are my window sizes? All those come into uh, play when you begin to figure out how much air conditioning is going to get pushed into just this room that we're in right now. All of that has to be figured out, and that's done through that manual J form. Uh, your seasonal, engine, seasonal energy efficiency rating, uh, which is also we call our SEER rating. Uh, the SEER rating uh, for most of your units is, is uh, in Austin, Texas, is 14 right now is our standard. Uh, we also do a res check, and what a res check is is a, a computerized analysis that measures the compliance of the insulation and factors and your window factors throughout your, your building code. Uh, it's just something that we have to do energy-wise energy through a, a house, and it's always good to see if you can get a copy of that from your builder and just keep it in your file as a as a owner. We also, uh, we're in still in the mechanical side of it, the structural wiring. You, you see three TVs up there at the top, and then you see the media room off to the side. This is a game room, media room area. Uh, we begin to talk about how we're going to set up the surround sound, which is your audio-visual side of, uh, of the house. We begin to wire those things and put those wires actually in there. We also do your security systems now. Uh, we go in and we figure out what do you want in security, motion textures, glass breakage, uh, pads. I mean, we've done a lot of things there. Your home automation, which actually brings in um, most of these functions together in one automation that bring together uh, everything from audio to lighting and everything else. Uh, your computer lighting system could be separate. Uh, this is run at this time as well if you just want a computerized lighting system. Okay, let's kind of move into our, our what we call our wall finish stage. Um, this is uh, in their insulations and we begin to, uh, to uh, understand what our R values are. What is an R value? It's a factor used to measure the the insulative properties of the construction materials. Um, that's basically your R value. You guys see uh, you know, where you have to put that in contracts nowadays uh, and just to be able to understand what that insulation actually is. In your wall cavities, uh, which is this is a picture of a wall cavity here, you have two before studs and, and two by six studs. You can have all kinds of different R values within those studs. You can go up to an R15 on a two before wall and you can go up to an R22 on a 2 by 6 wall. So you can do it in different forms. Uh, one of the forms would be bat insulation and this picture up here shows you the yellow part is actually what we consider bat insulation. That's pre-insulation that's already uh, rolled out in, in some form or fashion and cut and put in between what we call the wall cavities which is between each one of the studs. Another form of insulation would be your blown in blankets and that's the white portion of this picture. Uh, what that blown in blanket is, is basically fiberglass, much like what's at the top of your ceiling, uh, blown into to, uh, your top of your area of your attics. Uh, they're ac actually blown into walls now. And the advantage of that is you blow that into the walls, into that wall cavity, and you fill up all the areas where any type of air, air infiltration can come through. So it, it's, a good, it's a good part. You, get, you end up with about an R15 wall costs a little bit more, but it's really not that much. It's one of these items that we kind of recommend just because it's one of those payback items. It's one of those items if your customer and client's in there for two or three years, uh, you know, this extra money that they would spend would come back in the cost of the electricity cost alone just in their house. 
Uh, there are also another type of uh, one is uh, expandable foam. That's becoming very popular now. It's getting a little bit better on the price side of it. It will trap all the air from coming in, uh, that expandable foam, and it's a great product. It's kind of uh, from the insulation, we began to sheetrock the house. Uh, as we sheetrock it, there's different methods of sheetrocking, nailed or screwed. What we try to do is we screw the outside and then we nail the centers, what we call the field. Uh, the center portion of the sheetrock is nailed and the outside is screwed. That keeps from any type of uh, movement and stuff of that sheetrock piece. Instead of just going in there and having sheetrock nailed where you get a lot of your nail pops. You screw it and you screw it in place on the outside then you don't have the, that problem. Uh, another uh, part of sheetrock is what we call fire rock. This is a type of sheetrock. It's designed to uh, have, uh, uh, for fire purposes, have that rock on the outside. And usually you see the sheetrock between your garage and your uh, living area. Reason why is because that's a dangerous area in that garage that could catch fire uh, and uh, the car catches fire. You don't want it to go into uh, your actual uh, house and set your house on fire. So we use the fire rock in those purposes. Dura rock is a replacement kind of the green rock. If you guys have been around the industry at all, it used to be what we call green rock was your moisture rock. Nowadays, it, we use a Dura rock, which is a lightweight concrete product that we put up behind the tile areas. And what this does is it keeps from your tile actually going in, and, and when you push on it, you, you would cave the whole tile in. I mean, I, we've all probably seen some of those cases. Uh, the Dura rock won't allow that. It's a concrete product, so it's porous. So if the water gets to it, it actually goes through it. Uh, creates another problem, you know, from the backside, but at least your haul, your tile and everything else is not destroyed. Uh, there's a new product out in the last couple of years that's come out that's called Quiet Rock. The Quiet Rock is uh, uh, a sheet rock that you may put on a wall between your media room and your living room or your media room in a, in a bedroom. And what it does is it dampens the sound. You may put it on the ceiling. It's fairly expensive. It's about $20 to $22 a sheet. So it's an expensive rock, but it's a great product that's out there that you can use to, to deaden the sound in areas that you don't want that sound traveling across uh, walls or actually ceilings. So wall textures, after we sheetrock, we go into wall texture. We moderate drag as a type of wall texture. We have hand trowel. Uh, your hand trowel is sometimes called four seasons. There's different names for those uh, types of uh, 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 textures, but it basically it's applied with your hand in a trowel. You know, there's a little bit more labor intensive than a Monterey drag. Uh, you also have what you call Venetian plastering. That's what this picture is up there on the wall. Uh, this house is actually a Venetian plaster, and that's what you see uh, as the kind of modeling look or the cloudy look that you're looking at the wall. It uh, comes in and, and gives you different depths of, uh, of color. It's a very neat product. It's a fairly expensive product. Uh, it's about four or five times the cost of uh, hand plastering. Let's kind of go into the, uh, the interior finishes, cabinets. That's always one that, uh, you know, modular versus custom. Which way do you go? What do you do? Modular basically is a cabinet that is set up in a 30 inch, 32 inch, 34 inch. They're, they're standard sizes. Uh, where, as a custom guy, can take it 31 and 3 quarter inches by whatever. The modular ends up with your fillers a lot of times into corners and stuff like that. So you kind of see that. However, you know, you have a lot of your high end cabinets that are modular cabinets, wood mold, different cabinets and uh, pieces of that are actually modular. Uh, so, you know, it just depends on what that customer wants. And we begin to go through wood choices. You know, is it uh, knotty alder? Is it ash? Is it oak? Is it pine? Uh, what are we doing? Is it painted or is it stained? As we go through that process, also we we look at the uh, the style uh, of the doors. Is it an arch door? Is it a, is it a square raised panel? Is it a flat panel? How do we want it to look in, in the overall scheme of the decorating? In the uh, interior finishes, we come in and the door and the trims. We begin to look at that. You know, is it paint? Uh, is it stained? This picture that you're looking at right now, all the doors and windows are stained. The uh, baseboards are painted, the crown molding is painted, the wood beams are actually stained as well. We blend a lot of colors nowadays. That just seems to be a, a, a trend as we go through. It kind of lightens up. It doesn't make the house as dark uh, with the areas, but people like to pick up a little bit of the stained color. Uh, MDF, what is MDF trim? That's a minimum density fiber board. It's uh, pieces of wood now that are actually pulled and glued together uh, to make out a trim uh, section. They, they mold it into a big block and they come through and they cut, uh, they knife cut whatever that uh, piece is supposed to look like from a trim side of it. So, you know, we're, we're dealing in today's society and market with a lot of different alternative products that are out there. And MDF is a real good one. 
Uh, it paints out real nice, but that's usually where you see the MDF side. You may be installing some sort of block paneling, and this is the time that you would do that. Your interior doors, you got 6.8 versus your 8.0 doors. A lot of your larger custom homes you usually come in with an 8.0 door, and that's because you got a 10-foot ceiling or higher. You, uh, on a 9-foot, we usually use the 6.8 or less. Uh, it's just uh, the difference of what is our plate heights, and we determine that early on as we go through it. Solid core or hollow core. Your solid core doors are going to be your wood doors. Uh, it could be an MDF door as well. Uh, you have your hollow core, which are your masonite type doors. Uh, some of them are foam filled as well, but they're usually, they, they're not, a, they may be a six panel door on your masonite or a four panel door. A little bit, you're limited to your selection there. Uh, flooring options, uh, as we kind of go into our interior finishes, we have our hard surfaces. We begin to look at our tile, stone, and wood, and our uh, faux stone. Uh, what do we have? Uh, in our hard surfaces, we begin to put those down in the house. Uh, the carpet begins to go in, and there's that old transition strip area. You know, our transitions, remember we talked about how we want that slab to be perfect so that we come in and we have our wood floors and our tile and, and our carpet all meeting together and not having that wood transition strip. And that's all done up front, guys. That's all in the, in the planning stage uh, of those plans, and that's an important part of how you make your house look. Are you, you know, if you entertain a lot, it's extremely important because as you walk through the house, you don't want people tripping, especially with our lit litigious society in today's world. Uh, you don't want to go through that side of it. And then you have your decorative borders are getting installed. You know, a lot of these houses now, you come in and maybe your, your kitchen and your breakfast area, your living room, your dining room are all wood floors. And if you go and you have all those wood floors, you want to define the flooring somehow. And so you may come in and put some sort of decorative border down on, uh, uh, through uh, some archways just to define that area, whether that's the living room or whether that's the dining room. Uh, kind of going from the builder's perspective, from the uh, fixture installation side of it, we begin to install our light fixtures. Uh, the house begins to start taking a little bit of shape now. Uh, the appliances are going in. Hopefully we've done our job on the cabinets and we have the right cabinet hole built for the, uh, the appliances. Uh, the accessories begin to go in. Those accessories may be an outdoor kitchen uh, that, that's being put in place outdoors for a barbecue unit. Uh, our plumbing fixtures are going in. Our bath hardware, which is our towel bars, towel rings. So you're getting kind of a feel that the mirrors and glass are going. You're getting a feel for the whole house that it's now beginning to kind of take shape. So the customer is pretty excited. They're beginning to see what they actually chose, those colors. All of those things are beginning to put, be put together and make sense to them as they've made all those selections. We're kind of coming in at this time and we're doing our final home uh, preparation. We're doing all the little things on the outside and the inside of the home. We create ourselves a, a to-do list, uh, things that we should be taking care of internally without the customer telling us to do. We should have some sort of inspection to set up. So as we go through it, we create our own list. And we go through that house and, and find the things that we feel like are not acceptable or up to our standards and create that and, and begin to change that. We also, we're going into this final wrap-up of allowances. We sit down with the client and we actually give them invoices. Okay, so we go through all those invoices piece by piece and begin to uh, show them what they've spent, where they've spent it, uh, and they, they get a better feel and in, in, uh, through the whole process that, you know, they're actually getting this. There's no funny money put out there. This is actually the invoice that I'm actually paying. So they have that opportunity at, at this first financial wrap-up area. And then we set up with them kind of the closing. We've based our to-do list out there. Maybe it's going to take us two weeks to finish the house out. So we come out there and begin to schedule the closing for them and, and so that they can set the moving truck up and have the moving truck go. You know, one of the things that, that we should be able to do is, you know, as realtors and as builders is make sure that we get a client for life. And then one of these things that, that we do to do that is create the processes and put them in place. Uh, you know, there's nothing better than having a client come back to me and I've had them between one, two, and three, and four times I've built houses for the same people. There's nothing more enjoyable to do that. And that just goes to say what, you know, where are you at and uh, how are you handling your business? We obviously at Sterling Custom Homes have a passion 
We've got a passion for what we do, and that's important. And that's important to see as you go through and you interview your builders and you get to that stage uh, of completion, that, that it's not a, a negative event. It's actually a positive event. We've got letters at the office where we have people that actually have withdrawal symptoms you know, from us because they get so attached to us, you know, that, that they've gone through this process step by step all the way through, and they've just been a real enjoyable experience.